where they're uh, sort of living by so-called making the numbers. Uh, they do a lot of uh, things that really are counter to the long-term interests of the business. And, and I've never seen a company uh, whose performance has been improved by having some forecast out there by the CEO that we're going to earn X because the, uh, it's sending... It's not only sending the wrong message and delivering the wrong results to the uh, to the company and to the country. It's also teaching uh, the people that work under him or her that that uh, the quarterly performance is, is the the end uh, the end game. I, I tell our managers, just pretend you're going to own. This is the only business you and your family are going to own for 50 years, and you can't sell it, and you'll make the right decisions. Have you seen this kind of play out the wrong way, either in the boards uh, that you've sat in or the companies that you've owned, other friends that you've known? Becky, I've, I've been on 20 uh, boards of publicly owned companies, not counting Berkshires, and I have seen uh, I have seen managements that I really think well of personally. I'd be glad if they married my daughter or, or were named as executors of my will or moved in next door, but they get tempted by this, the predictions that have been made. Their ego gets involved, and, and when they find they can't make the numbers, sometimes they make up the numbers. And I, I, it, it's, a, it's a bad, it's a very, very bad practice. And once it gets going, it feeds on itself. Because if, you, if your investor relations department tells you, you know, if we, we put out you're going to earn a dollar eight, and you get this reputation for you know, making your numbers or beating your numbers, you're going to do some uh, very stupid things at some point because business does, just doesn't work that way. And uh, 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 for 53 years at Berkshire, you know, I, I consider Berkshire an unfinished painting all the time. And, and uh, the, the, the horizon really is uh, infinity as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Jamie, what does this mean from a, a real perspective? Are, are the companies in the business roundtable, I think there are 200 companies, are they going to not be issuing quarterly guidance at this point? Yeah, so, so let me just comment on what uh, Warren said. So first of all, remember, this goes down in a company. So there's pr there could be pressure at the divisional level, the sales level, that they should go do something different than they might otherwise do. And very often, it's very easy for a CEO to change a short-term profit number by not doing marketing they should do, by not opening the branches they should open, or by... You know, selling more product at a cheaper price, so they sure. can hit a revenue number, or something like that. So it, it just creates the disincentives. And like Warren said, it feeds in itself. If you start meeting that, and you have to meet it, and you have to meet it, you know, years later, you find that it, it corrupted. And so I think it's a good thing that people really care about how and when they use earnings guidance in particular. And so the BRT, you know, uh, I think of the BRT, something like 60% of our members do annual earnings guidance. Mm -hmm. You know, I would personally eliminate that too one day. And so it's something like only 20% plus or minus do quarterly. But this is, this is a first step to, to try to get people to focus in the long run. I should also say, by the way, most of these companies, they're pretty good at focusing in the long run, too, in terms of R&D and capital expenditures. This is just one case that we think we should go another step to, to improve uh, the governance of corporate America. Well, Jamie, let me ask you, you, you know, you mentioned that it, it's up to a CEO's discretion to be able to do this. So if you wanted to, how could you change the numbers at J.P. Morgan to try and, and, and do this if you were f more focused on short term? Well, I, you can change interest rate exposure by making a phone call and do some swaps and add hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue. You can cut marketing. A lot of people cut marketing because that's one of the easiest things to cut. Right. Uh, you can reduce, uh, you can pay people less. I say it's like airplane maintenance. You can reduce airplane maintenance, but that's a uh, really bad idea. Yeah. And so, you know, people yeah, yeah, shouldn't be doing yeah. Tell those Tell me things. if you're doing that anyplace. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, well, that's kind of what it is. You're doing, you, you don't have to build a new data center. Well, you, you should build the new systems you need. You should do the R&D you need and explain it to your shareholders and your board. And, you know, of course, you know, some of the CEOs will say it's the buy side. I mean, the sell side that we put pressure, but I'm trying to say to people, be free to drop it. You'll be okay. Companies have done it. The, she the good, smart shareholders don't mind. You have the best shareholder in the world sitting right, in right on this TV telling you it's better. He prefers it. He does want to hear how you're doing, what, how you're thinking about the future, what you're investing in. But, you know, he, he knows that quarterly earnings, it, it, they're, they're a function of the weather, commodity <laughs> prices, you know, volumes, competitor right. pricing. And we don't, you don't really control that as a CEO. You're, sometimes you're just kind of like you know, the uh, cork in the ocean. But do the right thing anyway, and you're going to be fine in the long run. Warren, what, what do you want to hear from companies in terms of guidance and what, to, what they tell you and what they don't so that it doesn't put those uh, artificial constraints on them? Well, I want, I, I want to uh, talk, uh, hear from them 
of what I would hear if I were their sole partner in a business. And they were the operating partner, and I was a uh, person that did not spend day to day at the business, but was had a significant part of my net worth in it. And they would tell me periodically the things that were important to me, and then they would tell me the the upside possibilities, the downside possibilities, where they were investing ahead of time, and and, and things that might pay off in a few years. And and I would want them to. Uh, I would want them to run it like we were going to be partners for 50 years and neither one of us could sell and, and keep me informed and, and, uh, and don't, uh, don't worry about what we earn today or in the next week. I mean, what's magic about a quarter? I, we're, we're in businesses for a very long period of time and uh, we happen to be in the insurance business and believe me, you can report any number you want in an insurance company for a while. So if you tell me I'm going to be shot unless I come up with earnings of X carried out to eight decimal places in the next quarter, believe me, I can come up with that and, and uh, the auditors will stamp it as okay. I, I know better than to ask either of you for any sort of quarterly earnings guidance from your companies, but I, I will ask you to forecast this, uh, the economy, because you both have a pretty good idea of what's been happening. Jamie, just this week, you said that you think we're only in the sixth inning when it comes to the economy. What, what, does, that, what does that mean and what are you seeing? Yeah, so when you, if you look at how the table's set, uh, the consumers are in very good shape. Their balance sheet, their incomes, wages are going up. Uh, their debt levels are low. All the credit written since the Great Recession is pristine, whether it's mortgage credit, other than student lending, which is done by the government. But it's mortgage credit, small business credit, large corporate credit. Uh, business sentiment is almost the highest level it's ever been. Consumer sentiment is the highest levels. Markets are wide open. Housing's in short supply. And my guess is mortgage credit will expand a little bit, not going back to subprime. So it looks pretty good. And the way I look at it, there is nothing that's a real pothole there. We don't have the leverage we had in 2007. Sure. Uh, so maybe, while well, it's been a nine-year recovery, it's been only 20%. And an average recovery would have been like 40% growth over more like a seven or eight-year period. So the slack is being pulled up, and it may very well be. It's just a very long kind of delayed cycle. You know, the sentiment grows, recovery from the Great Recession, uh, that you may, have, you may very well have years of growth. And I mean, I, I hate to forecast the future because I don't know, but it seems to me that's a, that's a logical possibility. And, and, and in fact, I think the growth is getting stronger today, not weaker. If we are nine years into this recovery and we're only in the sixth inning, I mean, just doing the math on that, you're talking about another three years of recovery. Is that yeah. a, 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 something that you say, yeah, that's not out of the realm of the possible? It's, it's definitely in the realm of the possible. And, you know, of course, we'll, cl we'll all climb the wall of worry if it gets longer and longer. And of course, one day we'll have a recession. And I, like I said, I don't like to predict that. And I don't, I, but the fact is things look pretty good. And also, we have the also additional stimulus coming from, you know, tax reform and, and other budget issues. So I think, yes, you can have growth. And it's, people don't want to see it. It's been a long time, so it's almost like we're too afraid to say it out loud. Yeah. Warren, how about you? What's the economy look like from where you sit? Well, right now, there's no question that it, it, it's feeling strong. I mean, if we're in the sixth inning, we, we, have, our, we have our sluggers coming to bat uh, right now, number three, four, and five in the lineup. Uh, it, Business is good. Uh, you know, I'm I'm no good at predicting out you know two or three or five years from now. Although I will say this: that there's no question in my mind that America is going to be far ahead of where we are now, 10, 20, and 30 years from now. Uh, but right now, business is good. There's no question about it. And as a result, you think the stock market looks affordable, Warren? Well, I, not as a result. I, I, the decision on the stock market should be made independent of the current business outlook. I mean, you then. When you should buy stocks is when you think you're getting a lot for your money, not when you think business is necessary. Not necessarily when you think business is going to be good next year. Uh, the time to buy stocks in America generally has been always with a few exceptions because the long-term outlook is exceptionally good. And I don't think you should buy stocks based on what you think the next six months or year is going to bring. You uh, had been buying stocks pretty actively in the first quarter. Fair to say that you still are buying stocks? Uh, I... I, I like buying stocks, yeah, but I, I'm a net buyer. <laughs> and, and Jamie, I've been that all my life. You know, I, I, I bought my first stock on March 11th of 1942, and we've had seven Republican presidents and seven Democratic presidents, and I've bought stock under every one of them. 
Jamie, let me ask you, the, the market wobbled a bit uh, last week because of the issues with Italian politics, real concerns about what people are calling quiddly or Italy, Italy. How big of a, a problem do you think that that is? And is it something that uh, potentially we could face some contagion over here? Yeah. So one of the things I should point out to the viewers is that, you know, Warren is speaking about this thing about the long-term trends. Mm -hmm. But obviously we've had problems, but it's amazing the, this ability, the, country, this, the ability of this country to continue to grow. And even the worst 10 or 20 year periods, we've used them rather well. And Bill Gates talks about a book called Factfulness out there. Mm -hmm. Stephen Pinker about the better angel of our nature, how mankind's getting better and better and stronger and stronger, healthier and healthier, living longer. And that is reflected in you know, markets and valuation and things like that. And obviously there's always something to go wrong I, I think the biggest threat to mankind is nuclear. Nothing, nothing other than you know, nuclear proliferation and things like that. And, and then you, know, you have things like Italy. That just is kind of one of those things that remind you that there is risk out there. And you, you're always going to have that. You could open up the newspaper almost any day and you'll be reminded of another risk. That might be Argentina, though I think that president is doing great things there. And so this just reminds us that it's not resolved. The Eurozone will have some issues. And, and you saw this wobble because people question again all of a sudden, you know, Italy stay in the Eurozone, which obviously I hope they do. The monetary union is the most important thing. So I hope that they do, and I do expect they will. Jamie, It'd be very hard for them to leave. I was going to say, do you expect that the Euro will still be here in five years and in ten years? The, I'm going to say, again, I hate to predict the future. I say yes. Exiting the Euro, Euro, the monetary union, will be catastrophic for anyone who exits. And there is no way out of that. And so I think uh, that when people see that and they... they don't want to do it. I think the, the EU is making progress with, with Merkel and Macron, mm -hmm. who are the, you know, the linchpins. You know, remember, Britain was never part of the monetary union. And I, if they continue to make proper reforms, yes, it can be a union that's strengthened over time. But it takes exactly what they're talking about. It takes fiscal reform, the ability for the banks to do pan-European banking, uh, you know, some regulatory reform and, and uh, certainty. Uh, some common, now they have to deal with certain issues, how they deal with the budget issues among the countries, but it's in everyone's interest that the European Union continue on that path, because the other path is really not a good one. Right. Warren, if you had to pick a side, if you were forced to take a bet on this, would you bet that the euro is here in 10 years? Yeah, I, I, I would bet it, but I, I, that, I, I don't consider myself an expert on it by any means, but sure, I'd bet on it. Uh, and I would point out one thing, and uh, I was just doing a little mental calculation while you were... Uh, Talking and I've been I've been investing over a period of probably over twenty five thousand days, and I would say if you took the headlines from the paper of those twenty five thousand days, I'll bet a majority of those headlines they certainly wouldn't be uh, good news or optimistic. I mean, just, you know, you can start with nineteen forty two when we were losing the war when I was uh, made the first investment. So the the news is usually. Uh, well, it's more often I think the headlines are bad than good, but but uh, the Dow was 101 at that time, and the Dow is, you know, whatever it is now, 25,000. So uh, America works, but the headlines are frequently going to be a kind of alarmist. The headlines lately here in the United States have been pretty good. I'm thinking about last Friday when we got that unemployment rate of 3.8 percent, and the new headlines this week that show that the number of job postings outnumber the number of people who are looking for jobs, the number of workers out there. Um, Jamie, I wonder, have you had any trouble trying to find workers at this point? What's it like in terms of trying to find employees? Yeah, we, we're, we're not, but this number is the lowest it's been in like 40 or 50 years. Yeah. And I think sometime later this year, it'll be the lowest ever. An amazing other number, if you take global unemployment, it will also probably this year at the lowest ever. And that's a good thing. We all want wages to go up. So at the BRT where I just was, you are having a lot of conversations. They're seeing wages going up. They're seeing uh, pressure to get people. But I look, I look at that as a good thing. That, that's sharing the wealth that's being created. We want wages to go up. You know, we'll probably be sitting here in a year worried about what, inflation and wages yeah. going up too high. But right now, God bless it. It's been bringing more people back into the system uh, back to work. Work is dignity. Work is great. You know, once people start in that ladder of work, they tend to move up a little bit. They tend to have household formation. So, you know, we should do everything as a nation. You know, both Warren and I support this thing called the Earned Income Tax Credit, right. which helps. It's kind of a little bit of a negative income tax, which helps pay, you know, people at basic minimum wages more money. And, and I just think it's so much better for society to have people working and having household formation and 
better for social outcomes. And so this is a wonderful thing. We should be celebrating it. And of course, we're going to start worrying about the downside of it soon. But <laughs> so far, so good. All right. We, we always worry even with the positive headlines. Warren? Yeah, Becky, and, and when you raise the question about whether we have uh, trouble finding people, uh, we have uh, six or so uh, home building operations in various places, Kansas City and Denver and Austin, Texas. And, and uh, there is a shortage of the labor required uh, in home building uh, uh, throughout the country. And, and we have home furnishing stores and, and carpet installers. Are the, the, uh, certainly in, 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 in truck drivers, uh, there's, there's a plenty of places where there are a lot of jobs that are unfilled right now. Can you solve that problem just by paying more? Well, uh, the, the people that are thinking about going into those jobs uh, want to get it solved <laughs> probably by higher wages. But the market system works towards solving problems like that. But 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 it is absolutely true now that there there are uh, there are uh, shortages of people in some fairly important type jobs. Let me ask you both about trade, because that's been an issue that both of you had said um, could create a little bit of a problem, could weigh on sentiment. Jamie, I know you've heard from the Business Roundtable, um, optimism levels uh, kind of off the charts when you're talking to um, all of those CEOs, but it did pull back a little bit, and you think it's because of trade. Why? It, probably. It's hard, hard to tell, but we did ask about trade. We did a, another special survey, and I would say like 80 to 90 percent are worried about if trade goes south. Prices will go up. They'll they'll invest less and things like that. So, you know, we, we're trying to be very clear about this. We think the president has raised some very critical issues about trade, particularly with China, around state-owned enterprises, fair competition, uh, uh, market access, value, uh, the ability to own 100% of a company, and these things should be negotiated out. And the business roundtable supports the fact those are issues. The business roundtable has been very quite clear that we don't think tariffs are the way to do it. Tariff has unpredictable outcomes. You hurt your allies, maybe more than you hurt anyone else. Uh, people tend to retaliate. You can incite nationalism in countries because you know, it's not the same thing if you and I negotiate and being tough on each other than you know if you put a country in a very tough position, how they might have to react. So it just has it can create these potential negative outcomes. And you know, so we're just very cautious about doing it that way. But and but want to support trade. We want to get NAFTA done. We think that you can make great progress with China, and that China will be very responsive to some of those issues. Uh, so that's, that's what we're pushing on for trade. Very quickly, the, the latest coming from the White House is, is yeah. that they are looking for bilateral talks instead of a, a NAFTA between Canada, Mexico, and the United States, bilateral talks with us in Mexico and with us in Canada. What do you think about that, Jamie? Well, I've disagreed. You know, they're, they're, we're stuck here on two issues, okay, the sun, for NAFTA, the sunset provision, right. which basically the president has today. He can rip it up whenever he wants. So we'll, why we're negotiating for it, I don't know. You know, it just creates more uncertainty for everybody else. You could argue the certainties there anyway, but the fact is you want more consistency. And there's other one called arbi various forms of arbitration mm -hmm. that you can go to an effective arbitrate as opposed to courts in Mexico, Canada, the United States. Creates a little more certainty. Everyone wants that. And, you know, you can make an argument why it might be better for the United States not to have it. It's better for our friendship with our neighbors. It's better for the companies. It's better for certainty. And I think, personally, that we should give that up and finish NAFTA. There are a lot of things that they have already negotiated and modernized NAFTA. So I'm quite in favor of doing that. And uh, uh, so it's just important we get these things done. Personally, I would have done TPP. And, and in trade, it gets very complicated. When you, when you start to do uh, bilateral things, it also is very much could be used against you. So what we're doing in some of these places you know, has now opened the door for much more complicated trade negotiations with our allies. But we, you know, and I just think you should, we should be working with our allies because we have a common interest. And not against China, but to set global standards that may not be exactly what we want, but those global standards, you know, eventually China will have to adhere to, too, including around reciprocity, uh, uh, investment treaties, et cetera. And so, you know, but look, the president's doing it his way. I, I hope it works. We're going to try to support as much as we can. But, you know, I personally would be doing some of these things differently. Let me ask you both about a big problem that you've been trying to tackle here at home. That's the rising cost for health care. Uh, the two of you, along with Jeff Bezos, have announced an initiative where you're going to be working together with this joint venture um, to really try and tackle some of those issues to help your employees and maybe even the rest of the country, too. Warren, when we spoke with you last month in Omaha, you said that maybe within the next two months you had hoped that you'd be naming a new CEO. Have you made progress on that front? Yeah, we have. And, and, and uh, the three of us and, uh, and uh, the uh, new CEO, uh, are we've, we've basically reached agreement. So we're just tidying up a couple of things, but we should have, we should have an announcement uh, 
uh, on that uh, matter within uh, maybe two weeks at the outside. But the, the work has been done, and uh, we have the right CEO, and, and, and we're I'm very enthused about it. I know Jamie and, and, and Jeff are, too. Jamie, you've met this new CEO, too? Yes, I have. The, the heavy lifting was done by Todd Combs. I want to give him full credit. And he, he went through a thorough process. But I think, Mike Warren, we have, we have an outstanding individual. Character, culture, capability, heart, mind, the whole thing. And, and uh, you know, this is a long-term thing. We're not looking for immediate success. But, 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 but there are a lot of ideas out there. There are a lot of things that can be done better. We know the fraud, the administrative costs. We know overuse and underuse of, of, uh, of various uh, drugs and specialized procedures. We know the end of life is often costs far more than it should and is far more painful than it should be. Uh, so there's so many, and, and with big data, there's so many things to do. But the goal is better satisfaction for employees. And you know, eventually we can learn a lot of things and maybe help inform uh, America how we can improve some of these things. Jamie, have you heard back from, from your employees about this? Warren, have you? Uh, and we'll start with Jamie. Yeah, a little bit. You know, there was a little bit, what does it mean for us? But it means the same thing. I mean, effectively, we do this every year for our employees. Every year we look at, you know, we use a lot of very good uh, uh, companies to help us do things in terms of claims and structure and uh, payments and, and choice and wellness. And we just want to do that better. And so what I told them is we're just going to try to do it better. And you should expect that we're going to do it the right way with the same kind of heart we've had before, but to improve your lives, improve your wellness, improve the outcomes, give you more choice, which I believe in you all the things that it will effectively be cheaper and you'll have healthy, much healthier employees. Warren, have you heard from your employees? Yeah, I, I uh, addressed a group of about 130 or so of uh, the various CFOs from all our subs uh, just a couple of days ago, and, and they're very interested in the subject. And, and the interesting thing is, as we went around interviewing uh, a large number of prospective CEOs, uh, we didn't run into one that didn't think that uh, improvement was both significant improvement was both possible. Uh, and important. So uh, it isn't like there's anybody out there that's connected with the system that thinks we've already arrived in Nirvana, uh, and they know how difficult the job will be to make major changes. But uh, they're all cheering for us to succeed. They, they, uh, they number of them might have wanted to be the one to help us succeed. <laughs> <and> we, <laughs> we settled a lot of one, but no, nobody disagreed with the the mission, the importance of it, or or. Uh, the feasibility, but they, it's also a very, very tough nut to crack, and it's going to take significant time. We've got the right person. So you guys are working on everything from problems facing American businesses with the long-termism versus the short-termism to this huge problem uh, for the country itself, and that's that's health care. And it has all kinds of people starting to wonder, Jamie, if you're going to run for president. I have no intention of running for president. Warren, are you going and to I'm run not for running president? for vice president either. Yeah. But, uh. <laughs> well, let me ask you, this week we spoke with um, Howard Schultz. He announced that he's uh, stepping down as chairman of, of Starbucks. He spoke with us on Squawk Box and said, yeah, he may be considering public office. He doesn't know exactly what that would be at this point. But we also spoke with Ken Langone, who was our guest host while we were speaking with How Howard Schultz. He said, look, the idea that Donald Trump won the presidency and people are saying this expands, the, this means a business leader could come in and run the country and that expands the talent pool as far as he's concerned. He thinks that's a good thing. Jamie, what do you think about that? Look, I, you know, I, first of all, I think business should collaborate with government and be involved, and the business people need to learn what the issues are in government. You can't just walk into government officials and say, here's what I need for my company and my profits, et cetera. You know, governments have huge issues they're dealing with in terms of, you know, of, of the poverty and, and incarceration and education. We should help them do that. And that, that's why I'm at do, helping do this job at the BRT and all the BRT members are deeply involved in that. So therefore, getting involved in politics, I think it's a great thing for anybody. So if you want to do it, I applaud it. I think it's hard. I'm not sure being a CEO naturally translates to that. You know, I, I, I saw Howard, and I think the world of Howard, and he'd be a great chief executive or governor or senator or mayor, whatever he wants to do. But it's hard, you know, and, and you've got to be in the, you, you've got to want it. This is, this is not, you're not going to be ordained to be the president of the United States. You've got to get out there and fight for it. And so... Uh, you know, CEOs aren't used to doing that, and I don't think all, all CEOs translate to that. So we'll see. But I think, it's, I think Ken is absolutely right. Getting people involved in government is a good thing. Collaboration with government is a good thing. Even having people like Ken uh, focus, having Warren help focus on health care is a good thing for America. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, government can't do all these things itself, particularly anymore in this rapidly changing, highly techno technological world. So I, I completely applaud it. I wish Howard, you know, the best. Warren, your thoughts? Well, I, I, I totally agree. We, we uh, uh, 
most business people would have trouble um, starting out a year early in Iowa and, and going from motel to motel and repeating themselves six or seven times a day, saying the same thing and listening with great interest to every possible voter as to what their suggestions might be. So I, I'm not recommending it uh, to any of my friends, but I do think it's very important that business be a, a handmaiden of, of, of government. Uh, business has done wonderful things for America, and America has done wonderful things for business. You both have said some pretty nasty things about Bitcoin recently. Which one of you uh, hates Bitcoin more? Well, uh, that would... Uh, I, I set a high standard. I don't know whether Jamie can top me or not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to be the Bitcoin spokesman. You know, just beware. <laughs> beware. And, and, and Warren, very quickly before we let you go, uh, we've made a lot about, we'd heard about the Uber deal. Uh, we talked with Dara Kosh- Kosh-Roskawi about that. And right. I know you had said that that report was uh, correct out there. Just wanted to, if there's anything you could add to that, that uh, the, the talks came and went. Dara said he'd love to have you involved with something down the road. Any chance of that? Well, I think it's it's very unlikely, but but I, I I don't say zero to anything, and it is true that we did have uh, a conversation a few months uh, uh, back, and certainly uh, as I said earlier, I'm I'm impressed with Dara and and, and Dara and, and the uh, uh, we just didn't. Uh, quite come to terms. But that's not a unique experience at Berkshire. Yeah. Uh, Warren, Jamie, I just want to thank you both very much for your time. We appreciate the efforts of what you're doing, both with healthcare and with the long-term approach that you'd like people to be taking with companies. Uh, We really appreciate your time talking about this today. Becky, Warren, thank you. I enjoyed it. Okay, great. Thank you both. You guys, thank you. That was excellent. And uh, even though you're in different states and far away, that was amazing. You played together so well. Yeah, Yeah, it really did. So thank you. Hey, Warren, thank you very much, both for the inspiration and for joining this. And hopefully we'll Well, make things a little bit better. I'm I'm with you 100% on this. And and even though you uh, threw some deserved uh, bouquets towards that, I will say that that, that, uh, Jamie has participated in a significant way. Uh, Becky, he... he, uh, his, his heart is in it as well as his mind. Well, I'm excited. I can't wait to, wait to hear who the CEO is. Thank you for teasing yeah. us. Great. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, guys. It won't guys. be long. Okay.